The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, a murder on the moon, chicks in their armored vehicles, a romp through a billion worlds, and soldiers lost in time and space. Plus, we continue our ongoing audiobook serialization of Timothy Zahn's Cobra, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's a pleasure to have you along. I am Bain Associate Editor and your podcast host, David F. Shirod. This week, we bring you Griffin Barber's discussion with James L. Cambius about The Scarab Mission, the latest novel in his Billion Worlds series. But first, the news. It's a new year and a new batch of hardcovers and trade paperbacks are on bookstore shelves. Let's take a look. First up, we have Poor Man's Sky by Will McCarthy. Homicide detective Ramey Vaught is a losing contestant in the biggest reality show ever, The Colonization of Mars. Brother Michael is a Benedictine monk who just wants to help the future happen. Andrei Bikovsky is an asteroid miner desperately escaping indentured servitude. Bridget Tobin is a hydroponic farmer studying the greenhouses of Luna. But when a fellow Mars contestant drops dead at a lunar monastery, these four souls will find themselves on a collision course with forces far beyond the control of trillionaires or nation states. As labor disputes erupt across this lunar space, the action of individual people will determine whose future will prevail and whose will perish. Next, we have Chicks in Tank Tops, edited by Jason Cordova. A boy and his dog. A girl in her tank. Tropes have been with us throughout all of history. Any girl would gladly trade in her skimpy armor for a tank. While a little bit of chainmail can take a chick far, heavy armor can take one even farther. Besides, what's not to love about chicks in tank tops? From pure near-future military science fiction to pride and prejudice with zombies, AI tanks, and true love. Also available this month in trade paperback is a subject of this week's podcast, The Scare Mission by James L. Cambius. Solana Cena is a scarab, salvaging wrecked and abandoned space habitats among the billion worlds of the 10th millennium. She and an oddball crew, a raven, a cyborg, and a dinosaur board the derelict colony Safdaghar hoping to score some loot before the colony gets catapulted into the outer reaches of the solar system. But Solana and the Scarabs come face to face with a gang of vicious pirates looking for slaves and treasure, and a mysterious stranger intent on preserving an explosive secret. Solana must overcome her own horrifying past to survive and escape before it's too late. And finally, Mission Critical by Charles E. Gannon, Griffin Barber, Chris Kennedy, and Mike Massa. Major Roger Y. Murphy should have died when his helicopter crashed off the coast of Mogadishu in 1993. Instead, he woke up in 2125, 152 light years from home. Murphy and one other... Murphy and 100 other lost soldiers have been tasked with a daunting objective. Establish a base of operations on the main world of Rabak, using local allies they have yet to recruit and enemy equipment they have yet to seize. But the company of misfits and ne'er-do-wells who've taken the nickname Murphy's Lawless rise to the challenge. That's Poor Man's Sky, Chicks and Tank Tops, The Scare Mission, and Mission Critical, all available now wherever books are sold. And that's it for the news. Hi there, I'm Griffin Barber, your host for today's edition of the Bain Free Radio Hour. Born and raised in New Orleans, Mr. Cambius went to the University of Chicago, getting an education in the history of science, which has served him well in modeling possible futures for humanity. Since 2000, Mr. Cambius has written a lot of excellent short fiction for a who's who of the very best SF venues, receiving nominations for his work from many of the best-known awards organizations. His first novel, A Darkling Sea, was an impressive debut. He followed that up in 2015 with Corsair about a near-future space heist. 
which is also on my shelves among my favorites. James then wrote Arcad's World and, in a slight departure from his usual, The Initiate, a fantasy novel, both published by Bain Books. He then penned the Godel operation, debuting a new universe, that of the Billion Worlds. The book we are here to talk about today is The Scarab Mission, a far future SF novel about a salvage operation gone horribly awry. The Scarab Mission is set in the same 10th millennium of the Billion Worlds universe that the amazing The Godel operation set forth for us. Hello and welcome, James. Good afternoon. So hardest question first, uh, what is the coolest aspect of the Scarab mission for you? The coolest aspect is, um, this is gonna sound like a little insider baseball, but it's that I managed to make it all work uh, with real physics. So, you know, the, the team is initially coming on board and, uh, at the uh, just after they've diverted the the orbit of this wrecked space station and they have until it's reaching its closest point to jupiter where uh, to get off of it again and you know after that close encounter it'll be slung off into the outer solar system and you know there's not really any getting home from that um and you know you'll probably starve to death or something so you know there's a there's a time limit and the time limit is basically how far it takes to get from the edge of Jupiter's hill, sp hill sphere down to low Jupiter orbit. And I worked all that out and it gave me a nice time frame for the story to take place in. Right. And, and one of the, to, to be clear, that this is the uh, uh, salvage operation that they're working on is on a habitat that is uh, de slowly departing uh, the, uh, or actually wouldn't be departing. It was in orbit, but now will be departing based on the fact that on um, what the uh, characters do. The salvage right. operators do because they're under contract, I believe, right? Yes, they get the job to you know move this derelict space habitat into an orb, a Jupiter encounter, so that it'll be slung off into the outer solar system where metal and heavier elements are really valuable. So people are willing to pay good good money in in gigajoule equivalents, which is the currency of that future. Um, but um, you know, if you've gone to all the trouble to to boost a space have into a new orbit if it's a wreck anyway that's going to be dismantled in you know 40 years or whenever it is that it gets out to the outward cloud um you know you might as well go on board and see if there's anything valuable and portable lying around um and this leads them to you know go into the haunted house <laughs> <laughs> so uh you didn't really stumble out of that and obviously you had to put it in some uh brain meat work uh, on it uh to get the uh the calculations correct and and work through that so uh was that something you you find enjoyable that you like to do is to kind of toy with those models um well i actually had to cheat a little i used um basically the timeline for the voyager probes because I flunked out of second year physics at Chicago so, and calculating, you know, transit times in orbit is one of those things that you need second year physics for. Right. Um, but I could cheat and use the Voyager probes timeline, basically. Okay. So uh, the Scarab mission has a lot of SF's biggest ideas at its core, including transhumanism, singularity, uplift, cybernetics, psychosurgery, and the colonization of space. Uh, did your world building come first or did it arise out of the story and characters were using to tell it? Well, this one actually has an interesting sort of dual history. Obviously, the, the setting, the Billion Worlds, I began to create back in 2014. I, I know that I happen to know that because I kept the original document I started. Um, and in that, it was basically what would it be like to live in a Kardashev II type two civilization, you know, the Russian astronomer Kardashev classified civilizations by their, by their available energy. Type one was a single planet's worth of energy. Type two was a solar system's worth of energy. Type three was a galaxy's worth of energy. And this was the only, these classifications are, are totally arbitrary, really. He was basically coming up with them as sort of benchmarks for how far away can we detect them, right? Right. Um, you know, he was an, he was a radio astronomer, and they're all they're they're all about you know how much energy is it giving off. Right. Um, but it has become a sort of a useful shorthand, uh, you know, particularly with the idea of you know people who hope, like myself, that we may someday actually do that. 
Um, so I started thinking about what would this be like? And um, I eventually came up with the billion worlds future where the whole solar system is colonized. Most of the sun's output has been captured and is being used. Um, there's about a quintillion humans or human equivalents, uh, you know, living in the various, in the billion worlds, space habitats, asteroids, terraformed moons, etc. cetera. Um, but of course, they're actually sort of like the marginal parts of society because the, the real civilization of the solar system is this uh, uh, group of, of super intelligent artificial intelligences in the ring around the sun where Mercury used to be. Um, and the inner ring they're called and um you know that's the actual civilization of the of that future and the they're billion, using most of the energy right yeah. right and you know they and a quintillion humans are kind of you know the equivalent of the third world you know what used to be called the third world in right. that future, because that way they are characters who exist on a scale that i can write about and my readers can yeah. understand yeah with, without going into too much uh, uh esoterica with the actual individuals that you'd have to or non-individuals the sentient minds and collective minds yes plus it's really hard to write about something that is you know orders of magnitude smarter than you are um, yeah, it's, it's easier to write dumb down but it's not so it's easy to go smarter um the other thing is the the other half of the idea for this particular novel though had been sort of kicking around in the back of my head for a good long while the idea of you know, a group of, I think I was using the term junk rats in my idea notebook, you know, living in and exploring some kind of giant, I think my original idea was that it was a giant alien derelict. And part of that eventually became a short story I wrote called Object 3, which appeared in FNSF and is one of my personal favorites. Um, and that one has, you know, a giant alien artifact and a sort of a human civilization sort of living on it like barnacles but they weren't really exploring it. The whole thing is that it's impenetrable in that story. Um, so, but that idea had been kicking around. And uh, once I came up with the Billion Worlds setting, I, I realized, oh, this is a perfect setting for that story. The, exploring the wrecked, a, a derelict and finding out what, what, you know, what happened. Right, so, to have the derelict, you have to have the society that made it in the first place. And uh, the reasons to explore it and, and uh, obtain the uh, the goods, as it were, from it. So yeah, the, I, I I really even in the physics, the description of the physics of uh, of the capture to realign and redirect the uh, the habitat was one of the cooler things I've read. You know, because I would, I kept thinking in terms of revolutions and and that kind of thing. And I can't remember exactly the term you used, but it, I think it was very specific. Procession, yes, you know, a rotating yeah. thing can can also start to tumble on its axis. Right. So I, I was I was like, okay, that sounds like it, uh, somebody knows a little bit about what they're talking about. Maybe they went through physics one, which I I never even approached. <laughs> I did make it through physics one, yes. Um, and uh, in fact, there's an interesting uh, thing. Um, if you notice, like in in like the Gerard K O'Neill's designs for the the island one space habitat where it's the two giant cylinders connected wow. it's in pairs because uh object you know rotate a, a, a rotating object can otherwise become unstable Stable, right you know um, some of it depends on the shape and the mass distribution but right and having to constantly tweak that if you if you don't have something that's to, to work right. against and, it. Yeah. and if it's inhabited then you know there's there's people or computers or both you know, doing the constant tweaking, but this one's been abandoned for 16 years and no one's taking care of it. Right. So uh, getting on to a little bit of the, uh, the characters that are involved in this, this, the Scarab mission has at its heart a woman with a very, very dark past uh, she struggles with every day. Uh, the tinkering that was done to her brain and even to her genetics presents an almost impossible obstacle to normal life. Uh, yet she continues to struggle against her nature. Um, how did this character and her background come to you? Um, again, I don't remember the specifics, but this is one that's been in my idea notebook for many years now. Once I started, I'm, I'm married to someone who does neurobiology, as a matter of fact, and the more we learn about the brain, the more alarming it becomes. Because if you're like me, a materialist, you know, 
I am this, this meat inside my skull, well then anything you can do to that, you're gonna be doing to me, you can change me. Right. You affect how I think. And, you know, the more we learn about the, the, the things that can affect how we think, you know, the, the scarier it becomes. I mean, Solana, uh, the main character, you know, she is, she was created to be a slave and that is scarily plausible, you know, <laughs> hopefully you and I won't see that during our lifespans, but, you know, in, that's something that will probably be possible within centuries rather than millennia. Right. And I may be being, you know, I, I may be, you know, wildly off base and it may be possible in decades. <laughs> <clears throat> Well, certainly there, there, there's a lot of stuff going on with you know, biofeedback and things like that that uh, make it frighteningly plausible, yes. Um, so which character in the Scarab mission surprised you? It's a fairly minor character, but she did surprise me, is um, um, Tanaka, who is one of the gang of, we may as well call them pirates because that's what they are, who um, show up at one point during the story. And I had initially thought that she would be sort of more of a a willing henchman, henchwoman, um, you know, with the, with the the pirate boss. But um, as I was writing her, you know, I I started thinking about well, what does she actually think is going on? And I think I came up with a more interesting version of it, so that she finally gets a you know a, a cool death scene. Anyway, this is not spoilers. <laughs> this is a horror story. Nobody's getting out alive. <laughs> It's very few. Right. And so how did she come come about? You were saying you were uh, tinkering with her because she had to, you had to have a crew. Right. Um, I wanted to have a, a range of reasons for being part of the, uh, of the Jacka's band of pirates. Um, and so, you know, one of them is, is there just for the money. And one of them is there because he, admires her and one of them is there because he needed to get out of town in a hurry and she's there because she has this relationship with Jacka. <clears throat> so uh in a similar tangent or a vein on these characters uh, which character from the scarab mission would you want to avoid like the plague and uh why well if we're limiting it to uh, there's an obvious answer which i'm i would be kind of on come under the spoiler alert uh, uh heading i think there's the the very obvious answer which when you've read the book you'll know who i mean um or what i mean um but among the the human characters i think i would stay away from i'm not going to say jacka the pirate leader who is you know a very manipulative psychopath but at least is entertaining i would actually um um stay away from um her uh her sidekick um um the um, mercenary who um is just too damn dumb <laughs> you know? is this the chimp uh no the the chimp i i don't have the book open in front of me so I'm, i i have to confess i'm blanking on the character's name of course <laughs> but um um no, the the chimp is is shrewd. I he would he would I I wouldn't mind him having my back. But there's a, a mercenary who you know admires Jacka because he is just too damn dumb not to. <laughs> I'm trying to remember too, and I can't. I, problem I have too is that I I but sat down and read the. I was so intrigued by the the scarab mission uh, as world that I went back and read the the Godel operation. So uh, I'm kind of conflating a couple of those things, even though there are spoilers there are some characters that may have made an appearance in both books there is one yes oh. um the this story takes place about 30 years before go to operation oh all right okay this is because of a clever stupid idea i had which uh, <laughs> my publisher talked me out of my clever stupid idea was i won't write a series i'll write a slice i'll write a whole bunch of stories that are all taking place at the same time and Ms. Weisskopf basically suggested that people actually like to have the same characters or at least some of the same characters, right. yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, so I, I compromised and wrote a 
a prequel, although I call it a non-prequel because it um, there is no plot connection to go to operation. There's no, um, you know, there is there's at least one character in common, but there's no. Um, you, know, you don't have to have read this one to read that one or vice versa. No, yeah, and that that was one of the neat things about it. Both of them are are discrete novels that you can dig into and enjoy. Uh, and uh, so I, I appreciated that about it. I just wanted to read more about these billion worlds because, like I said, there's so many big ideas in here and, and uh, had a lot of fun with them. Uh, I, you know, the only other person I've ever read that, uh, you know, kind of had that same uh, wildness going on currently is uh, Hamilton, Peter F. Hamilton. Hmm. So he, he does quite a number on that, uh, on that scale as well. But uh, again, I, I really, I really dug both of these books. They're uh, uh, scare mission in particular yes i always like a salvage mission being a, a travel traveler player and that kind of thing as well so i have three little black books <laughs> myself <laughs> um and uh yeah in fact I, I i was writing a blog post about this the other day and i mentioned that you know you can sort of see part of the origins of this going back to 1978 when i got my first D, &D set because right. oh a group of people are exploring a ruined complex in search of treasure <laughs> Gosh, that sounds familiar. Right. <laughs> so, uh, uh, which character would you want as an ally? Like, without a doubt, um, <clears throat> um, Para, the uh, the dinosaur mercenary. Yep. Para is a she's a you know genetically engineered sentient raptor dinosaur. More or less, I use the Utah raptor as the the physical model, but it's always worth remembering that you know. She is very definitely the creation of human genetic engineering. She's not an actual dinosaur, <laughs> right? Um, and so, you know, but she's uh, she's a fun character. I enjoyed writing her. You know, she's she she's the voice of reason at many turns in the whole thing. Uh, yes, she is mostly the one who is telling people, "I think this is a bad idea," and he's usually right. <laughs> right, and and she's also got the the science things. She's a a military engineer, a sapper kind of right. thing and the mercenary so that that's one of the cool things about her is that she kind of gives you that science edge but she's also a soldier uh yeah. so she can give you both of those and then she has this alien outlook of like you know uh, of being a dinosaur <laughs> which is uh, i thought was really entertaining and and she also has a really good uh, uh storyline in the uh in the tale you're telling yeah she gets uh she gets uh that she was a character, although ironically, my initial version of the character was not a dinosaur, but I definitely wanted to have a character who was, you know, seemingly self-interested, but, you know, ultimately heroic. <clears throat> and she definitely gets that. So uh, are, are any of the characters, including her, are they uh, based on real people? Yes and no. Um, I very seldom directly base characters on people I know. Um, partly because, I mean, it gets a little awkward, um, but also it would just- Oh, well, I don't know why. I, I mean, don't know very like, many sentient dinosaurs, you know? It's not like so many people die in, you know, in your, yeah. in your book here. <laughs> but also in a sense, they are all based on, I mean, if nothing else, I have to be able to inhabit all of them. So they're all based on little facets of my personality, I guess. Right. Um, which, uh, you know, I don't know if I want to admit that given some of the villains I've written, but it's true. You know, you have to be able to think how this person would think. <clears throat> At least make them uh, sound reasonable right? to themselves, if no one else. So uh, I, I guess you've kind of already answered this, but uh, are we going to see more about uh, more from any of the characters in uh, the Godel operation or Scarab mission? Right. So the book I'm working on now, provisional title, The Miranda Conspiracy, um, is a is a direct sequel to Godel operation. It's got most of the same characters in it, although there is also a character from this novel who is not in Godel who will turn up in it. Neat. Well, I'm excited for that. You know, hopefully uh, it gets out there quick because uh, I, I have cleared a lot of my reading desk uh, already. Well, I have to still finish writing it still. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so many of the characters uh, of the Scarab mission claim to have good reason to do what they do, but only a few seem bent on improving themselves rather than improving their economic status. <laughs> Is this a comment on our current culture? 
Well, actually, I would say it's a comment on human universals, you know. Um, um, we've all got the hierarchy of needs, right? And you know, you've got to take care of those lower levels of the pyramid before you can go up to the top. And um, some people have asked me how I can write characters who, you know, are struggling in a, what is a post-scarcity society, right? <clears throat> and part of it is, uh, even if people have, you know, a matter printer that can make more or less any physical object they desire, um, people still want status. And wealth is a quick shortcut to that. Um, you know, so in fact, I don't know if this is getting into spoiler territory, but the, the one I'm working on currently, you know, takes place among the, the super wealthy of the, uh, the moon Miranda, Uranus's moon. And, you know, their, part of their super wealthiness is that they have, you know, things made out of wood and things like that, you know, right. that somebody actually made. And in fact, that's an element in, in Scarab mission, now that I think about it, the space habitat, Saftagar, it's people, their main industry was making stuff by hand, which could then either be exported directly or scanned and basically turned into printer templates. And then they get a, you know, a tiny royalty. But when you have potentially a quintillion customers, you know, even a tiny royalty adds up. Yep. So uh, there are vast inequities in wealth and power in this Scarab mission, even among the stars humanity and its offshoots seem bent on pursuing their own goals in their own particular way leading to power struggles on and among various habitats. Uh, was there a particular era of our history you were thinking of when you wrote the Scarab mission? Um, the, the political landscape, I guess, you know, the size of the solar system and communication lags and energy costs and transport mean that I don't think it's possible to have a, a to have large centralized governments. I mean, large in the sense of you know controlling a significant fraction of the solar system or something you know for example you know i doubt that earth could control much beyond the moon you know for example and and um so it's uh, the feel is very much sort of 17th 18th centuries where transit times are long um although you know communication is faster it's it's the 17th century with radio i guess Right. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, transit times are long. Trade is luxuries rather than staples. Nobody's moving. I mean, yes, people are moving mass around, but that's all, you know, just a bunch of unmanned payloads. Nobody cares about, you know, well, nobody cares about it unless you can find a way to make them care about it. Right. That That's another plot element of the one I'm working on. Right. But, um, or they have a need for whatever is being moved. Right, but the, you know the 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 the, st the thing that people you know trade to make fortunes is is luxuries and, and rarities. Right. Um, and you have lots of polities. Some are more powerful than others, but no, there's you know no hegemon. At least not beyond you know in a given region there might be, but not no globe. There's no British Empire. Yeah. yeah right. there's no american hegemony there's no yeah. there, there's there are some solid states though like uh the the one the ring uh, uh around for mercury was I, I guess that would be the like the single most powerful polity in the yes you know, by far yes yeah. you know, they were taking on everyone else and winning handily but they, <laughs> but um you know in the in the billion worlds future one of my perennial great powers is deimos you know, which by this point is actually a ring around Mars. The original moon has long since been, you know, excavated away to nothing. Made materials, yeah. Um, and uh, Deimos is powerful because partly of, of just, again, physics. Um, in terms of energy, it is one of the easiest places to reach in the inner solar system. Like, I think it is easier to get from Deimos to Earth's moon than it is to get to the moon from Earth, which, you know, make, and, and then if you have an elevator down to the surface of Mars, all of a sudden that means that it's cheaper to ship, like, stuff, Anything. food or whatever, from Mars to the moon than it is to ship it from the Earth to the moon, things like that. So they are, you know, a commercial and financial hub and have been since the 
21st century or so. <laughs> that was that was one of the neat things for me. I, I'm always interested in in history and and uh, you know the uh, the economics of how it all works. So one of the fascinating things for me was yeah they, they have reasons for doing what they're doing and they're sensible economic reasons for you know going that little bit farther than they might necessarily have to because you know the the whole hab itself. Uh, is the reason why they're saying, you know, they're there to uh, scavenge it is uh, or to to send it out for materials to be broken down and uh, that kind of thing. But why they want to be on there and doing what they're doing is because they're looking for those riches that they can find uh, within it. So I, I thought that was uh, an interesting uh, way to kind of go about it in the the, the fact that you have you know the, the sentient ship, which is operating the you know the basically is, it seems to be the nexus of the of the whole mission. Like she yeah. assembled her crew to to do this. Yeah, Yene is the boss. The, yeah. the human and dinosaur and bird and cyborg are all just hirelings. <laughs> yeah, so that it was uh, like I said, I, I really enjoyed all the big ideas be, kind of coming together in this logical uh, framework that that seemed to work for me anyway. I mean, I'm. I don't have an education to to match uh, many, but uh, I thought that was pretty fascinating the way it, it uh, all kind of linked, linked together in an actual system that I could identify and understand. Um, so the level of minds with a baseline mind approximating a human biological brain's capabilities is often discussed in the Scarab mission. Uh, where did I, this idea come from? Was it something you wanted to explore more in this work? Well, uh, it, the idea is that, you know, th there's a there's a cutoff at which you are a person as opposed to a thing. And that's if you are a baseline, then you're a person. You have some degree of legal rights varying depending on what society you're in. I mean, poor Anton, um, one of the other main characters is from a society where that doesn't get you much in terms of rights. Um, or and, or it, it it doesn't right now. And it seems to it used to have. Yeah. But they went through a political. Yes, he's he he he's, was part of a revolution that created a totalitarian state, and found out the hard way what happens to revolutionaries in totalitarian states. <laughs> um, uh, but um, so uh, you know, but baseline is sort of that's yeah, that's a human equivalent. Um, and then I sort of my rough personal. Line, you know, rule of thumb is that every level above that is more or less a factor of 10. You know. Wow. Although, you know, again, how you can say that something is a hundred times more intelligent than something else is kind of arbitrary, but, you know, it's, it's if you had a hundred people working on something all at once, you know, that they could. A hundred smart people. <laughs> yeah. Hundred people who yes think considerably faster than you or I do. Right. No, I. I, I, our, brains, I just wanna, our brains work at the speed of sound, not the speed of light. <laughs> right, and it's it's impressive though the 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 uh, one of the things again like you were saying uh, earlier is it's it's hard to necessarily think smarter, uh, but you know one of the things that like the success of Sherlock Holmes is that the the reader is made to feel like they're almost as smart. Yes, they are smarter than everybody else except for Holmes because they're getting it, right? And uh, it, not so much in this one because there weren't there. You're not dealing as much with the, the higher order minds, but uh, uh, the Godel operation that was one of the cooler things that, uh, that I got out of that was feeling like I'm almost as smart as these guys, uh, and and that makes is a real thrill for any reader to to feel like oh I'm piecing it together as quickly as others are so. Uh, lots of fun there to be had. Yeah, that was, I remember one bit in Godel Operation, and I think it also happens in Miranda Conspiracy of compa comparing the time rates of digital intelligences to biological intelligences, where you know the digital intelligences are having a conversation in between the words of a conversation that one of them is having with a biological intelligence. Right, right. That must be a challenge to write out. To try and not not drop the thread while you're communicating yeah. these uh, this, these varied levels of conversation. At least in one case, I remember what I simply did was wrote out one conversation and then interleaved the other one. Gotcha. 
No, that makes sense. The, the one of the things I, that reminds me of is uh, um, Joan Vinge's uh, uh, the telepath when uh, Cat's Paw. I bet I haven't read that one. I uh, said so they're uh, telepaths, so they're having a co regular conversation, but they're also exchanging uh, mm -hmm. thought conversation kind of at the same time. So that's always cool. Yes. When yeah, like, and, and I. And a logistical challenge for the writer, so to carry it off without making it seem kind of like well, you're struggling too hard there. So I was I was impressed by that uh, level of uh, coolness in here too. I had to do a little of that in Arcad's world. One of the species there, in addition, they could speak verbally, but they also had a gesture and color language communication mode, and they tended to use them at the same time. So I would. They have to say what they're saying and then say what they're doing, what they're signaling as well. Right. So it's, yeah, I mean, that's, I guess that's the same also with, uh, you know, gestures and that kind of thing or expressions on the face. It's just another uh, level to communication that some people will pick up on and some will not necessarily. Um, so I don't see mention of social media in the Scarab Missing. Uh, is it a dead thing or is it simply not present uh, in the setting of this novel? It's simply not present in the setting. Um, you know, Saftigar is a dead hab. The, the, the servers are down and they're not coming back up. Um, and also there is the issue of, of time lag. So any kind of social media would be in, beyond whatever world or hab you happen to be on would be asynchronous. You know, you can send out tweets, but you can't do Zoom chats. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, um, so uh, yes, I figure, you know, there would be a tremendous amount of social media. Um, in fact, in the one I'm working on, one of the characters is what we would call an influencer, basically. Um, and one of the things I've alluded to here and there is um, autonomous messages, which is basically, right. you know, instead of just sending a note, you send a, a software agent, which is almost as smart as you are. And so, you know, it can, it can have the conversation for you at the other end. <clears throat> And you so, know, I mentioned like autonomous contracts, which can actually do like negotiations themselves. So setting the parameters and then they go off and do their thing. Uh, right. It's another cool idea that it's it's one of the things it reminded me of. Um, uh, well, uh, uh, I can't remember what the company's name is, but, but where they're uh, reputation defenders like they, they go through the Internet, crawl through the Internet and protect your name and. Uh, your rights and that kind of thing. So it, but rather than it being a company, it's just a, a set of algorithms or uh, yeah. programming that you can just spin off. Um, it's pretty fascinating stuff. I, I, again, I, I enjoyed the fact that like, you know, people get a distant look while they're trying to work on something inside their head if they're a meat person. And if they're uh, a, a mech, they just basically roll around. You can't tell what they're thinking or doing otherwise. So... And again, that that uh, speed of thought versus speed of electrical, you know, actual uh, impulses was uh, it was pretty cool to to kind of look at. It's one of the things I wonder about with cyborgs is you know that interface. Uh, interesting. How, how fast will it really be? You know, uh, as oh, opposed to that one other social aspect, I guess, affecting the the social media universe in in the billion worlds is just the sheer scale of things. I mean, there's, there's a quintillion people. So, you know, a city of a million people is about as important as one individual on earth today. Right. right. So, you know, a war involving hundreds of millions of people is more or less the equivalent of like a gang brawl somewhere, you know, right. is that gonna be on the news? I mean, maybe if it's really big or if there's something particularly notable about it on that gets caught on video maybe or it's right? close by like in your neighborhood yeah, yeah if it's in your neighborhood you care if it's across right. the planet you know well even if it is across the planet though that's still your neighborhood right because right. it may have some spillover effect on what's going on with you but yeah that's that and that's one of the things that i liked about uh, this too is, is that you know you do have these neighborhoods the planetary systems so jupiter being one mars being another you know the ring all that kind of stuff where you have uh, these power plays that are going on, but because the solar system is so old and our occupation of it is so old, you also have like, this is how it used to be, but now it's changed and uh, we don't really care because it doesn't really affect us. 
uh, really a neat, neat kind of thing. It, it, it's, uh, uh, I guess it's kind of, for me, it was, it was much like the, uh, well, the imperialism uh, of the colonial era was like, you know, well, it doesn't matter to us because they're not important. Right. They're, uh, they're foreigners. They're <laughs> yeah, they're foreign they're way off there. And it, it, that same kind of concept, but you know, they're they're completely accepting of all these, like, you know, the Corvids running around. There, if there is any kind of like uh uh like looking down on anybody, it's basically be, because they're not uh, uh above a baseline uh in yeah. intelligence. Below baseline, I mean that's one of the you know chief insults too, is you know. Right. You refer to somebody as like you know he's a zero point eight or something. You know? Right. <laughs> so, um, one of the things that writing this has really driven home to me is the the scale of the solar system. Yeah. Um, you know, we tend to think of like you know the the, the the elementary school textbook where the planets are all in evenly spaced orbits. No. <laughs> yeah. Jupiter and its moons is a solar system. I mean. Right. It's, its sphere of influence and its moons extend out about half as far. Well, as, it's radiation. If yeah, nothing else, it's radiation. <laughs> I mean, you know, half as far as the Earth's distance from the sun. Yeah. You know, so Jupiter is a, a you know small solar system all of itself. In fact, basically, once you start thinking that way, you realize that oh, so the solar system is really the sun and the planets out to roughly the to to Mars and or the asteroid belt. And right. That's like that's the sun and its moons. Right. one of the sun's moons and right. then there's jupiter and its family of moons which takes up you know slightly less space because it's smaller but and then the, each of the outer planets in turn has its own sphere of influence some of which are enormous because you know it's a tug of war between the planet and the sun for influence and out in the outer solar system the sun's gravity is weak so even a smallish planet like neptune right. can have you know exerts a major effect on the sort right. of environment the sphere yeah. of influence is as big as the inner solar system Wow. <laughs> yeah, and the, the scale is truly mind-boggling, you know. And so when, when people look at it, go, oh, the billion worlds. No, yeah, the billion worlds. <laughs> uh the, you know, just even uh, with regard to I, I can't remember how what the mass figures are on Jupiter, but it literally it, in other ways it's that it's just its mass. It's just basically short of being a sun anyway. <laughs> it's it's 300 times the mass of the earth, roughly. No. And the sun is a hundred thousand. But it's amazing. It's it it really is a, a, an amazing uh, to to think of, and then the time scale for uh, how long it takes them to make an orbit, how long it takes the you know folks to. One of the things I I liked about the way this worked with the mechs and the uh, meat folks and stuff like that was, you know, it, it takes reaction mass, which is expensive, which is you know that kind of thing. But also, how bored would you be if you spent twenty years? Uh, you know, in stasis or not in stasis, but in in a cockpit with two or three other people, it was your interactions and having a time lag to deal with anything else to talk to anybody else about outside of your little bubble. Was yeah, so humans when they travel tend to travel in stasis if it's right. any kind of long haul. And, and I enjoyed the even that that, and then that the the mechs will also slow themselves down so that they're not having to think as much. Or just <laughs> Just broadcast, just tight beam their their mind to a new body on new body. Yes. So that was one thing I had a, a question on: is, is is it possible for biologicals to tight beam themselves to a new biological body? In the my building? my rule my my sort of hey, secret explanation for that in this setting is that it is possible, but it's costly because we're not data, right? So what you actually have to send is basically a scan of the whole inside of your head, you know, um, or some sort of, you know, make an emulator program that will emulate all of what your neurons are doing and then broadcast that. And um, yeah, so yes, it is possible, but at some point it's easier just to go. <laughs> right. right. So uh, the mission of the crew of the Yanai is to obtain a saleable salvage from the wreckage of the habitat that used to house thousands, I think hundreds of thousands or at um, least thousands of people. Saftigar is a smallish hab. I think it has, a. I think I posited a population in of the 10,000 range. The ruin they left behind is haunting on many levels, not least because the most valuable salvage, the things the crew of the Yanai are there for, are those that were created by mundane human hands 
and baseline minds, even though it is a simple thing to use their technology to make perfect copies of the output of those hands and minds. Uh, Where did this idea come from? Because it was uh, it was up there with my cool ideas in this book. It comes from what I was talking about earlier about, you know, to some extent, status becomes more important than survival at this point, you know, and what is the biggest marker of status is that you can use someone else's time, right? That has become the, I mean, it's true already, right? Yeah, In yeah. Modern economics, what is the, what is the main expense always? It's labor, you know, someone else's time. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, so, you know, if I have a chair that was made by somebody with their hands, even now that's kind of valuable and impressive rather than being made by power machinery or whatever. Right. And so just extend that into the future. Yeah, artisanal versus industrial or whatever it may be. Exactly. And I feel like that will become more important. <clears throat> the reason I, I, economics gets into everything I write, I think, is because I went to Chicago as an undergraduate because that's a college known for its economics department and it sort of pervades everything kind of the way, you know. Um, I'm trying to remember, is it Eddie Chicago? Code gets into everything if you go to MIT. Is it University of Chicago or is it Northwestern that is where fun went to die? Where who, who, oh, University where fun of goes to die. Fun goes to die, yes. Um, yeah. My wife, I believe, had that t-shirt. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no, I, I grew up in Illinois originally, so I, I have a little feeling of what the, what the schools are like and that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's amazing how uh, no matter what we do there, you know, no matter where you go, there you are, Buckaroo Banzai, uh, and our how our background kind of tells us what we're going to be doing uh, or informs whatever we're doing now. Uh, so I already mentioned this, uh, I, and you already said that you're working on the uh, the third book in the Billion World series, uh, and you've talked a little bit about that. Uh, apparently, we don't have a date for it because it's not quite finished yet, uh, but. Uh, what uh, kind of has been your inspiration for working on that one? Well, that one, um, well, A, it's, it's kind of a what happens next after to the characters after Godel Operation. But also it's kind of one of the things that goes into it, I guess, is an old, another old idea of mine, which is you know, the, the time scale for transit, physical transit in the outer solar system, especially when you're dealing with things like the Oort cloud, which is you know, thousands of astronomical units out from the sun, the transit times get to be immense, you know, if you're in any kind of low energy trajectory. And so one of the plot elements that I started me thinking about it is, you know, suppose you have a payload of something valuable and it's going to be traveling for decades, you know, the value of it will fluctuate as it travels, depending on the market and right, right, yeah. the value of what it's carrying and its likelihood of getting there and all that. So, you know, it's as if you can like buy futures in, you know, a, a, a well, in fact, you can, as a matter of fact, in the real world, you can buy futures yeah. like a shipment of oil or something. Right. But you know, imagine if that shipment of oil was something that your grandchildren would ultimately get, you know. <laughs> or, or you would four decades later because you were sleeping. Right. You know, that, that was, I mean, again, I, I, uh, it's really a cool concept for me. And, you know, yes, being aware of or partially aware of how vast our uh, solar system or its, uh, its stellar neighborhood is, uh, I thought that was really cool. That, that was one of the concerns that they, of course, they have is if you don't get off the, uh, the, the hab in a timely fashion, you're going to be there for, until they get to wherever they're going. And uh, you may or may not be a lot around to, to survive that based on how much energy you have to, to keep yeah. yourself going. So yeah, it was very cool. The AI, um, character, the AI character could probably survive, but it, you know, I doubt it would enjoy it. But yeah. um, you know, there's probably not very many ways that a biological being can live that long <laughs> or certainly sustain that long. <clears throat> right. So, uh, you you have a lot of uh, gaming in your background. Uh, just wondering if you're playing anything right now. As you as you uh, uh, suggested earlier, in fact, I am been running a traveler campaign. Oh. Uh, a couple of years back, I decided to dust off my little black books and start running a 
it's, it started out in person, but has gone, on, but went online for the uh, uh, pandemic and has remained online because while we were playing remotely, I recruited some players who don't live nearby anymore. So, um, and it has been a whole lot of fun. I, I took it completely old school. It's a, it's a, if, if, if the term means anything to you, it's a complete sandbox. You know, the players oh, yeah. basically decide what's the, what they're going to do and I respond to it. And, uh, and you're using the original uh, rules? Um, with a, a few elements imported from the most recent edition, the fifth edition. From yeah. our um, um, we started off using that because one of the players had bought it and it was like, oh, here's the cool new edition. But the more I read it, the more cumbersome I found it. So, at, so when, when that player was no longer part of the group, I decided, screw it, we're going to go with the we're going to go old school we're going to go with the original rules with the one exception of this task resolution system which i really like <laughs> cool so is and one of the things about i was like i'm a big gamer myself so the, the, the how much of that kind of uh, kind of informed your your early formation as a writer this is going off you know the, the, did you first find it when you were in school in grade school high school what well so i started playing uh, role-playing games in, like I said, 1977 or 78. And, you know, I was 12, 13 years old. Um, so that was middle school. And, you know, I've never really stopped. Um, and my first professional writing was writing role-playing game adventures back when all the game publishers had print magazines, you know, house magazines. Right. That was a decent way to do freelance writing. I could crank out, you know, a new a three thousand word article in a week, um, and you know there was a bunch of markets, um, and uh, that let me, you know, learn to write good while getting paid for it. Um, uh, the biggest problem, though, I have had to, I did have to unlearn some things, because in a in a role playing game, your character tends to have an upward trajectory, right? They they start off as a low level mook. And they learn stuff and they gain skills and they get cooler stuff and they get more powerful and they face more dangerous opponents, but you know, they they usually can overcome them. Right. Um, whereas of course in a work of fiction, you actually have to reverse that, right? You know, the characters right. start off in a position of strength and lose everything <laughs> and are stripped down to what they're you know they're essential. Oh, neat. That, yeah, that's, that's, that was a little tricky. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it was. That's cool. I, I'm just again, that's for me personally. I'm, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of the gaming, and I, I, again, it, as it informs people's writing, uh, several other Bane authors are also big gamers or were big gamers when they were uh, younger, that kind of thing. So, very cool to know. So, uh, what aside from its considerable raw entertainment value, do you hope readers will carry with them long after reading the Scarab Mission? Um, in, in addition to its raw economic, uh, raw uh, entertainment value, economic value to me, um, I, I hope they carry away with them the sense that all of this is possible. You know, I'm not, I'm playing with the net up here. I'm not making any of this stuff up. I mean, I'm making it all up, but there is no magic technology. There is no hand wavium. There is no unobtainium. Everything is, fits the laws of the universe as we currently understand them. So this could all, we could make all this true. Just not to have the will to do it, right? Well, and, you know, enough time. <laughs> yeah, that too. Well, certainly the, it was the 10th millennium, right? So right. Uh, last question, what conventions can your fans hope to catch up with you at? And what other work do you have in the pipeline for your fans to read? So conventions, I am definitely going to be attending both Arizia and Boscone in Boston. Same hotel, as a matter of fact, the Western Waterfront. Um, Aresia is in uh, a week and a half. Um, Boscone is in a month and a week and a half. Um, I will be at both of those. Um, <clears throat> other conventions uh, I have not yet scheduled. Um, I will probably be at Albacon in Albany if, if they hold it this fall. I frequently go to PhilCon in uh, uh, the Philadelphia suburbs. And if somebody cares to invite me to a convention, I'm I'm a cheap date. I'll show up. 
Uh, ever consider Dragon Con? I have, although boy, uh, you know, getting a hotel room for that is a bear. <laughs> Um, if you you know if if you know a publisher that might have a some a block of rooms reserved, let me know. Well, they they do have guests, so and the applications op are open right now. So well, that's a strong possibility then, actually. So, uh, well, thank you very much. This has been Griffin Barber in conversation with James L. Cambius, author of The Scarab Mission, forthcoming from Bain Books. And thank you for being here with us today, James. Thank you for having me. And now we bring you Timothy Zahn's Cobra. Earth's only hope was the Cobras. The colony world's Adirondack and Silvern fell to the troughed forces almost without a struggle. Outnumbered and on the defensive, Earth made a desperate decision. It would attack the aliens not from space, but on the ground, with forces the troughs did not even suspect. Thus were created the Cobras, a guerrilla force whose weapons were surgically implanted, invisible to the unsuspecting eye, yet undeniably deadly. But power brings temptation, and not all the Cobras could be trusted to fight for Earth alone. Johnny Moreau would learn the uses and abuses of his special abilities and what it truly meant to be a Cobra. The drive back to Ariel was quiet. Johnny, expecting MacDonald to be somewhere on the far side of Furious, braced himself for a hair-raising ride on the bumpy road. To his surprise, though, MacDonald drove with a calmness that bordered on the sedate. But the backwash of the car's headlights showed clearly the tension in his jaw and around his eyes. Johnny took the cue and kept his mouth shut. Lights were still showing in the Eldyarn house when MacDonald brought them to a stop across the street. Parked in front of them was the car Chris's father had taken to Rankin. Obviously, he'd arrived home too late to take it back to the village garage. As before, Chris answered the door. Come on in, she invited, stepping to one side. You're earlier than I expected. Short meeting? Too long, MacDonald growled. Chris's eyes took on a knowing look. Uh-oh. What happened? Chaloner want you to petition for more cobras again? MacDonald shook his head. And nothing so amusing. They want to take over the planet. Chris stopped in mid-stride. They what? You heard me. They want to overthrow the governor-general and set up a warlord system with little fiefdoms for all of the cobras who join him. Chris looked at Johnny. Is he kidding me, Johnny? she asked. Johnny shook his head. No. Chaloner's dead serious about it. I don't know how they hope to do anything but get themselves slagged, though. Just a second, she interrupted, moving toward the door to the bedroom wing. I think Dad had better hear this. Good idea, MacDonald grunted, stepping to the corner liquor cabinet and pouring himself a drink. Holding up the bottle, he looked questioningly at Johnny, who shook his head. A couple of minutes later, Chris was back, a dressing-gowned man in tow. Ken, Johnny? Dr. Oren Eldyarn nodded to them, looking wide awake despite his sleep-tousled hair. What's this about some kind of cabal being formed? They all sat down. The Eldyarns listening intently as MacDonald gave them a capsule summary of Chalinor's proposal. But as Johnny said, he concluded, there's just no way they can succeed. One cobra's fighting strength is essentially the same as another's, after all. But orders of magnitude higher than anyone else's, Eldyarn commented. If Chalinor announced he was taking over Thanksgiving, there's really nothing the people there could do to stop him. Surely there are a few other weapons there, Chris argued. We've got at least a half dozen pellet guns here in Ariel, and Thanksgiving's bigger than we are. Pellet guns would essentially be useless against a cobra except in cramped quarters where he couldn't maneuver, Johnny told her. The firing mechanism has a distinctive click that's loud enough for us to hear, and we'd normally have no trouble getting out of the line of fire. The troughs on Silvern took forever to learn that lesson. But that's not the point, MacDonald said. To kill twelve rebel cobras, all it should take is twelve loyal cobras. Unless the rebels manage to target all the others before the battle starts, Chris suggested suddenly. Couldn't they kill everyone in one quick volley if they did that? MacDonald shook his head. The optical enhancers we've got now don't have the multiple targeting capability of our old ones. But okay, let's say it'll even take fifty cobras if the rebels are dug in and you want an absolutely sure victory. 
That's still only a twelfth of Zhu's forces. Chalinor has to know that. So the question is, what else does he know that we don't? Eldjarn stroked his chin thoughtfully. Anything happening elsewhere on Aventine that might be pinning down large numbers of cobras? Civil unrest in one of the other districts or something? Johnny and MacDonald exchanged glances, and the latter shrugged. Nothing we've heard of, he said. I suppose it's conceivable that Chalinor's organized groups in other towns for a simultaneous declaration, but I don't really believe it. The spine leopards are on the move again, Johnny suggested doubtfully. That'll keep a lot of cobras on patrolling and hunting duty unless the farmers went to stay out of their fields for a few days. I can't see that worrying the Governor General, though. Maybe Chalinor's just lost his mind. Not Chalinor. MacDonald was definite. He's as sharp and level-headed as they come. And Lest wouldn't have come in on this on the strength of Chalinor's sales talk alone, either. That one was a weasel even before we hit Aventine. I'm inclined to agree, Eldjarn said slowly. The timing here is too good for megalomaniacs to have come up with. As you point out, Johnny, the spine leopard migration will hinder any official countermeasures at least a little. Less coincidental, I'm sure, is the fact that the Dominion courier ship left Capitalia just a few days ago, which means it'll be six months before anyone from the Dominion touches down here again. Plenty of time to consolidate a new regime, MacDonald growled. They can present the courier with a fait accompli and dare Dome to do something. And the dew drops out somewhere in deep space, Johnny said with a grimace. Right, Eldyar nodded. Until it gets back, there's no way for Zhu to get in touch with anyone. And even then, if the dewdrop can't land somewhere secure for fuel and provisions, it won't be able to go for help. No, Chalinor's thought this out carefully. It's a shame you couldn't have played along a little longer and found out the rest of his plan. I did what I could, MacDonald said a bit stiffly. I won't lie about my loyalty to anyone. Sure, I understand, Eldjarn said. For a moment the room was silent. I suppose I could go back to them, Johnny said hesitantly. I never really stated where I stood. They'd be suspicious, MacDonald said, shaking his head. And if they caught you passing information to us, they'd treat you as a spy. Unless, of course, Chris said quietly, you want to go back. Her father and MacDonald looked at her in surprise, but her gaze remained on Johnny. After all, We've been assuming Johnny was solidly on our side, she pointed out calmly. Maybe he hasn't really made up his mind. This isn't a decision that we should be making for him. Eldjar nodded agreement. You're right, of course. Well, Johnny, what do you say? Johnny pursed his lips. To be completely honest, I don't know. I swore an oath of allegiance to the Dominion, too. But the government here really is doing some potentially disastrous things especially the overextending of people and resources. What Chalinor said about our duty being to the people of Aventine isn't something I can dismiss out of hand. But if the legal avenues for political change are ignored by anyone, you open the way for total anarchy, MacDonald argued. And if you really think Chalinor and Lest would do a better job, Ken, Chris put a restraining hand on his arm. To Johnny, she said, I understand your uncertainties but I'm sure you realize this isn't an issue you'll be able to stay neutral on. And you'll need to make your decision soon, Eldjarn pointed out. Chalinor wouldn't have risked telling such a long shot as Ken about the plot unless they were almost ready to move. I understand. Johnny got to his feet. I think perhaps I'd better go home. If I decide to actively oppose Chalinor, you can always fill me in later on anything you come up with tonight. At any rate, he met MacDonald's gaze firmly. What's been said here already is between the four of us alone. Chalinor won't hear any of it from me. Slowly, MacDonald nodded. All right. I guess that's all we can expect. You want a ride home? No, thanks. I'll walk. Good night, all. Like the farming communities Johnny had known on Horizon, Ariel generally closed down fairly early in the evening. The streets were dark and deserted with the only illumination coming from occasional street lights and the brilliant stars overhead. Usually, Johnny liked looking at the stars whenever he was out this late. Tonight, he hardly noticed they were there. 
There had been a time, he thought wryly, when simply gazing into Chris's eyes would have immediately brought him back onto her side, no matter what the cause or topic at issue. But that time lay far in his past. The war, his failed attempts to re-enter mainstream society afterwards, and seven long years of working to build a new world had all taken their toll on the rashness of youth. He had long ago learned not to base his decisions on emotional reasoning. The trouble was that at the moment he didn't have a terrific number of facts on which to base an intelligent decision. So far everything pointed to a quick defeat for Chalinor's group, but there had to be more to it than the obvious. Whatever his other irritating characteristics, Simon Lest was an excellent tactician, his father having been an army training instructor on Asgard. He wouldn't join any venture that was obviously doomed, and a long bloody war would be disastrous for the colony. On the other hand, Johnny's allegiance was technically to the government of the Dominion, and by extension to Aventine's governor-general. And despite Lest's sneers, MacDonald's sense of loyalty had always been something Johnny admired. His brain was still doing flip-flops when he reached home. The usual bedtime preparations took only a few minutes. Then, turning off the light, he got into bed and closed his eyes. Perhaps by morning things would be clearer. But he was far too keyed up to sleep. Finally, after an hour of restlessly changing positions, he went to his desk and dug out the tape from his family that had come with the last courier. Putting it on the player, he adjusted the machine for sound only and crawled back into bed, hoping the familiar voices would help him relax. He was drifting comfortably toward sleep when a part of his sister's monologue seemed to pry itself under a corner of his consciousness. "'I've been accepted at the University of Erie,' Gwen's playful voice was saying. It means finishing my schooling away from Horizon, but they've got the best geology program in this part of the Dominion and offer a sub-major in tectonic utilization. I figure having credentials like that's my best chance of getting accepted as a colonist to Aventine. I hope you'll have enough pull out there by the time I graduate to get me assigned to Ariel. I'm not just coming out there to see what the backside of the Troft Empire looks like, you know, though Jamie ought to be able to pull any strings from Asgard by then, too, come to think of it. Speaking of the Trofts, there was a sort of informal free-for-all debate in the hall at school the other day on whether the Aventine Project was really just an army plot to outflank the troughs so that they wouldn't try to attack us again. I think I held up our end pretty well. The stats you sent on the output of the Kersiage mines was of enormous help, but I'm afraid I've ruined any chance I might ever have had of passing myself off as demure or ladylike. I hope there's no ban on letting in rowdies out there. Getting up, Johnny switched the player off and by the time he got back into bed, he knew what his decision had to be. Gwen's cheerful tapes to him, full of confidence and borderline hero worship, had helped him over the roughest times out here in a way that the quieter support of his parents and Jamie hadn't been able to duplicate. To willingly take on the label of traitor, especially when the situation was by no means desperate yet, would be a betrayal of both Gwen's pride and his family's trust, and that was something he would never willingly do. For a moment he considered calling MacDonald to tell the other of his decision, but the bed felt more and more comfortable as the tension began to leave him. Besides, it was getting late. Morning would be soon enough to join the Loyalist cause. Five minutes later, he was sound asleep. That was another installment in Timothy Zahn's Cobra, and that's it for the podcast. Thanks as always to Audible.com and podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. Praise, thanks, and gratitude to James L. Cambius, and good night, Tony Daniel, wherever you are. This is David F. Shirod coming to you from a soundproof bunker somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. Thank you.